Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have ex-Big Law recruiter Sadie Jones here with us to talk about how to interpret news and headlines that you might be seeing around law firms and the overall economy. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have ex-Big Law recruiter Sadie Jones here with us to talk about how to interpret news and headlines you might see around law firms and the economy. Welcome, Sadie. Thanks for having me back. My pleasure. Well, we all know the economy is a bit shaky right now. We are in the spring of 2023. What do you think is going on in relations to law firms and just the current economy? Well, I would say that law firms just kind of follow what, you know, any big companies are doing. Um, You know, maybe not exactly, but I think, you know, they're looking at what's going on too. And so they're probably, you know, doing some cutbacks. Um, You know, there could be some layoffs, some hiring freezes, um, that kind of thing. And I think they see that, you know, we're in a downturn. It feels like we're not really sure what's going to happen. You know, is this kind of the low? Is it going to get a little bit lower? I don't think that anyone thinks things are collapsing in the same way that they did in 2008 very suddenly. Uh, But I think that they're being cautious and that like everyone, we learn something from such a huge downturn. Right. I mean, I think the reality is a lot of the business at these corporate firms tends to follow things like mergers and acquisitions. And if that is trending downward and companies aren't doing that sort of thing because, you know, the interest rates are higher, they can't get funding, you know, all of these things, it just all kind of feeds on itself a bit. I mean, most firms are relatively diversified. You know, they have a litigation practice, they have a corporate practice, not all of them. But you know, they do, certain firms are probably more exposed in certain areas than others. Um, you know, some of them may have counter cyclical practices, like bankruptcy might be big for them, and that might be trending upward. Or labor and employment. <laughs> when, right. When companies do big layoffs, actually, you know, those groups do well. Yeah, exactly. So I think with any particular firm, it's hard to say sort of, oh, this firm is, you know, going to have problems or whatever. Um, but I think, There's often a general trend that if the economy, the business economy is trending downward, then things get a little bit shakier at law firms. But I do think you're right. You know, this doesn't look like 2008 where suddenly like things just blew up overnight. Yeah, I think there are and there are some firms where people sort of know that like X bank is their main client. Right. You know, so if that bank's not doing well or isn't going to have a lot of business or is it going to cut back, then the firm's probably going to have to follow, um, you know, and that bank is probably not going to completely collapse. And so neither were the law firm. But, you know, think about that. If you hear like, oh, this is their main client, you know, that client's not doing well. Right. I mean, I have to imagine outside counsel for Silicon Valley Bank probably wasn't super happy when they imploded. But, you know, that was like not it's not something that brought down the entire financial system, like the implosion of, you know, Lehman or Bear Stearns or something like that. And a lot of these companies use multiple law firms and I think they spread out their business. So that's probably better, too. Right, exactly. I think a lot of that kind of shifted after 2008, Mm -hmm. because in that case, like law firms literally went under overnight as well. And so, you know, again, like on the other side, if that law firm was your primary person that you worked with, suddenly you're in like pretty serious trouble. So there's just, yeah, I think people on both sides have kind of spread the love a little bit more. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, let's talk about deferrals because there's definitely been headline news about that. I think I saw one and sent it to you being like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Tell me what's going on here. So my initial thought when you sent that to me was, what is going on here? (laughs) This looks serious. Uh, And so I always go and read the article or 
Uh, we were talking about how some things are behind paywalls, but if you Google it, you can usually find some free information somewhere if you don't have a subscription or don't want to start a subscription. Um, and so look into the details because headlines often are kind of clickbaity and they want you to look at it and they got what they wanted. Uh, and so what I saw from that one was that they were referring to it as a deferral. Really what it was, was that the start date was being pushed back to January of 2024 from let's say October, November. Most firms haven't actually announced their exact start date, but generally they start late fall. So to me, uh, you know, as a recruiter, that doesn't look like a deferral in like my, you know, definition of the word. To me, a deferral is that you got pushed back a class year, you know, an entire year, which is something that happened a lot in 2008. Um, and, you know, people had to find other jobs or were given other jobs with a smaller salary. This is really like two or three months of sort of, you know, being pushed back so that probably they can get their ducks in a row and figure out, um, you know, how much work they have, what practice group people are going to be in. Um, they are going to save some money. Most of these deferrals pay a stipend. That one was paying $10,000, which is obviously a lot less than you would make as a first year associate. But it's not an insignificant amount of money. And if you're coming from law school, um, you know, you probably can budget it out, um, you know, to make that work. It's not, to me, that isn't like a dire situation. Um, and you can probably, you know, work with your loans, you know, to have them start paying back later or, you know, you should find out about that. So that's kind of what I was seeing, really. I didn't see anything where it had gotten pushed back an entire year. It was almost all um, start dates getting pushed out to January. And um, if, you know, if I were guessing, I would say that's going to become more common. Right. I mean, in some ways, I guess you have to give props to people who are doing this sooner, even though they take the hit in terms of having articles <laughs> written about them. Because, you know, at least if I'm an incoming associate at one of these firms, it's already announced that I'm not starting until January. Well, I can plan my life around that, you know. Do I try to move someplace cheaper for a few months? Do I take a beach vacation? Do I take another job, you know, doing something in like the gig economy? Um, you know, how do I manage my money? Like, that type of thing. I think it's actually in some ways better that they're announcing this sooner. I totally agree. Um, and I actually have the opinion and, you know, law students might not see it this way. And I know I come more from the employer side, but the opinion that that's sort of being responsible and to start a bunch of people and not have a place for them and not know where you're going to put them, uh, more of those people are going to get laid off quicker than planning it out and waiting a little bit longer. Um, that's just my opinion. That's what I've seen happen. So to me, that's like a more responsible way to deal with it. And usually if they push it back and they, like you said, they make that announcement early, it's unlikely they're going to keep pushing it back because that would be a much bigger hit. So I would take that as that's for real. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I mean, you know, Obviously, I, I don't know. Like, yeah, something major could happen. <laughs> but the entire if everything tanks. <laughs> yeah, if everything stayed the same, that would be my guess. Right. Yeah. Um, so you don't think they're just sort of pushing this off indefinitely. You think this is more like, well, we need to get stuff together and figure this out. And then you'll be starting, you know, yeah. in January in a new year, a fresh fresh payroll year or whatever it is. You know? That's what I think. That's what I've seen happen in the past. Those are, you know, the experiences I've had when I've been part of those decisions. Uh, and it just doesn't look good to announce things more than once. Um, right. So if all of a sudden every other firm started pushing them back a whole year, then yes, you might follow suit. <laughs> but I think it's unlikely. And I think... You know, there was a while where January became the norm mm -hmm. for this because it is a little bit easier for firms to start with the new year that way um, and give them a little bit more time to, to get their ducks in a row. And I will say that what I've also seen happen is that they individually take some people earlier. You know, it turns out the economy is doing better and the practice group picks up. I've seen that a lot. So while you should plan it out, you know, be prepared if they came to you, you know, whether you could start earlier, because that's, an, you know, the flip side of this. 
Yeah, I guess the other advantage of waiting is that people all have their bar results. So, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately, that might become a bigger issue for people. Like, usually, if you are at a firm and you fail once and you've already started, they're like, okay, you know, you can take it again, no problem. But I mean, I would be a little more concerned about that in this scenario, I think. That's a really good point. Um, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you couldn't take it again or they wouldn't give you the chance, but they may say that you can't start until right, you exactly. have passed. So then that could, you know, get pushed out longer. But, you know, we've talked about bar results and kind of hand- how to handle that with your employers. Yeah, what I can see happening here, say you're supposed to start in January, you find out in like November that you failed and they're like, well, you need to study and pass the next test. So you're not going to start until the beginning of March after you take the February bar. Yeah, that's what I would think would happen too. I mean, that just seems logical to me. Because the thing is, if you're taking it for a second time, the firm actually really wants you to put all your time into studying. Um, even if you're working there, they usually make you take unpaid time off to study right. um, and that should be your priority. So, right. you know, I just think of this. In this scenario, I think they're going to yeah. be more inclined to let you take, have you take more time off by just not starting. <laughs> Absolutely. I also think what you have to consider is, you know, what practice groups are going to be busier or slower and just be prepared that they could ask you to be in a completely different group than you had thought you'd be in and, you know, be prepared to say yes to that unless you don't want to start there so you're going to have to be much more flexible because that's so much of this is trying to slot people into practice groups yeah i think that absolutely makes sense like i don't think it's a time if you've been deferred to come back and be really specific about well only do this type of work because the reality is they may just not need you in that type of work and they might need you somewhere else And you need to be like, that sounds great. I would love to learn more about this area. (laughs) Exactly. And I don't think, I mean, a firm never wants to put somebody like in litigation who had only wanted to do transactional work. You know, maybe they don't get general corporate, but they get bankruptcy or something. But I have seen situations where it's like, you have to be in the opposite practice group. Um, And to me, it's better to just start and do that. And you can switch later when things change. Um, So just, you know, think about sort of your flexibility. Right. Because presumably if what you want isn't available at this firm, it may not be available other places Mm -hmm. either. Exactly. (laughs) So So, like we've talked about some of the groups that would be busier or slower, you know, in this kind of economy. So think about that. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, if someone has been given a deferred start date or they later get one, what do you think is the best way to handle this going in as a law student beyond just kind of being flexible? So I would get ahead of it, you know, find out what's going on at the firm, hopefully through, you know, like a personal contact that you had from being a summer associate or a mentor. Um I wouldn't call up the hiring partner and ask them for like the official line on it. I'm talking about somebody that you're comfortable with and just ask like, what are people saying? Um, You know, are you hearing about layoffs? I think it's fine to kind of try to get that information. Right. um, You know, in a tactful way. Right. I mean, I think probably they have heard about this too and may be concerned about it. I mean, people may or may not give you a straight answer, but if it's somebody that you connected with or, you know, was your mentor or something like that, like you're particularly like probably an associate mentor, I might consider going to that person and just saying like exactly what you said, like, hey, you know, I have gotten this information. How concerned do you think I should be about it? Yeah. And I think it'd be great if it was someone in a practice area you're interested in. So you'll get an idea you know, of whether that's going to be a possibility, because a lot of these things are specific to the groups like I've talked about. Um, But usually they'll tell you, like, what are people saying at the firm? What are the associates feeling like? What's morale like? I think is a great question to ask. Yeah, and I would probably try to do this like over coffee or lunch Mm -hmm. or something, not in writing, because (laughs) people are probably going to be sort of reluctant. I mean, even a phone call is probably better than asking people like specifics in writing, but just be like, hey, you know, I have gotten this information. I'm kind of concerned about it. I'd love to like, you know, go out for coffee with you and just kind of get your take on it. Like, are you available? I also just wouldn't put it in writing because I wouldn't want them to forward it to somebody, you know, like it could end up kind of in the wrong place. Right. I might not even put what I said in writing. I might just be like, hey, I, you know, I'm excited to catch up, (laughs) excited to start soon, excited to start, you know, want to catch up. Are you free for coffee? I mean, they're going to know why you're asking. 
Exactly. But yeah, I avoid writing at law firms True. about things that are yeah. that are questionable. And that includes tax too. Um, yeah. Anything in writing, just keep it super basic. And yeah. if they if they say no, reach out to somebody else for the same sort of request. Like, exactly. hey, I just want to catch up. Like, you know, are you free? Like yeah. no nobody's gonna, gonna be know. shocked. Yeah, they're gonna know where <laughs> yeah. you're at, why you want to talk to them. <laughs> All right, what else? Yeah, so something else I think is really important is sort of what we talked about, but you know, budgeting, figuring out how you're going to spend that time, you know, maybe it's an opportunity. Uh, Maybe, you know, like you said, you can get a part time job to make more money. Maybe there's a class you want to take. Maybe there's somewhere you want to go. Maybe you want to catch up with your family that you're not going to see once you're really busy. Uh, So I think there's lots of things you can do. But start thinking about that earlier, uh, rather than later, and make sure you're not going to run out of money (laughs) because you can't go back to them and say like, oh, I need an advance. Like that's not going to happen. No, and you can't get student loans anymore. So (laughs) exactly. So you, so really, I think that's like number one. And if they're telling you that, you know, they're deferring it now, then that's plenty of time for you to figure this out. And maybe you start cutting back even now. Right. uh, Because you had thought, oh, you're going to start this, you know, yeah, Good I remember job. like the last few months of law school, basically I was like literally living on credit cards because mm-hmm. they, on your third year, they give you less loan money, even though you, because they assume you've got this other job. And yeah, there was definitely like a big credit card bill waiting, but you know, I knew I was going to have this other income and I, yeah, it was just, maybe it was even after my clerkship because I knew I was getting a signing bonus. So like, I just think you have to plan for these things, like you said. Um, and in terms of time, I mean, if you can't think of anything else, you could always do like volunteer work, pro bono, like know something to keep yourself busy basically yeah i would use the time so you're not just like literally sitting around i think it's better for morale and how you're feeling and you know you're not going to have time to do that stuff probably once you start yeah absolutely Um, another thing i think is really important is figure out about your health insurance benefits um almost always health insurance starts on the first day of the month following when you start somewhere Mm -hmm. um that's a pretty blanket rule i don't know if there's any exceptions and there is absolutely no way to get you on a plan until you actually work there there's no way around it someone cannot do you a favor they can't just say (laughs) they're gonna do it there just isn't (laughs) and people ask about it all the time so um that's a good thing to know even if you'd started on your regular date you know that it's if you start on on October 3rd, it's not going to start till November 1st. So if you have health insurance through your school, you may want to continue it or look on the, you know, open market or whatever it is. But I think that's really important because, um, you know, it's it's important to keep those kind of things up or whatever other benefits like we talked about um, figuring out, you know, if you don't have to pay your student loans back until you actually start or you can work on that kind of thing. So just make sure all of those sort of things, you have your ducks in a row. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you're under 26, you can probably be on your parents' uh, health insurance still. You know, all these things are definitely worth looking into. And this is not the kind of thing you want to leave until the very last minute because, you know, on a lot of these marketplaces and stuff, it can take a little while to get stuff active. So Mm -hmm. you just want to make sure like you have a plan and you know what's happening. And you don't want to be that person who's calling like HR at the firm that you're going to be starting like, oh, I didn't figure this out and it's November and I don't know what to do and can you help me? And it's like, now it's your problem. (laughs) And they're going to be annoyed by you and they're going to remember you when you do start. Um, So this is your responsibility. Be on top of it. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, hopefully they gave you certain information when Mm -hmm. this was announced. But if not, I think it's absolutely fair to follow up and say, hey, I just had some questions about, you know, health insurance. Like, when is that going to be starting so I can make other arrangements? Exactly. Sound responsible. Sound like a grown up. Yeah, I like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I mean, we've talked a little bit about, you know, whether people should panic about this, but what particularly what does this mean for people who are going to be going into 2L recruiting? Do you think there's reason for concern here? So I kind of never think there's a reason to panic and panic isn't a good response to anything even drastic. But I do think there's a reason for concern. And if I were going into 2L recruiting now, I would assume that hiring is going to become tighter. There's going to be smaller classes. It's going to be more competitive. Um, I would definitely feel like I needed to be on my A game. 
I would be starting all of my stuff as early as possible. I would be really organized. Um, I would figure out how to put my best foot forward. You know, what's the the best all my documents can look? You know, have I prepared for interviews? Because I think you're going to need to up your game and I think it's going to be competitive. And I, I think you need to think like, you know, maybe I can't go for as many reaches as I could have, you know, a year or two ago when the economy was looking better. Um, so maybe you want to figure out some more like fallback options. Um, but yeah, I think you have to think things are going to be tighter. Yeah, I think that's kind of the message we're seeing across the board. I remember a couple of days ago, I saw a headline about certain firms not advancing people like with their class year if they hadn't met certain criteria. So it just kind of seems like people are tightening up requirements sort of across the board. And I think that's pretty likely to feed into the 2L recruiting as well. And again, I think this isn't a bad thing because all of this stuff prevents there being layoffs later. And it's better to, you know, not be somewhere for a year and get fired than to find somewhere where you're going to be able to stay for longer and there's work for you. Um, So, you know, it may not be your dream top choice, but I do think that's like a smarter decision. Right. And with the summer classes, you know, if you can only potentially offer 20 offers, it makes sense to take 20 people and not take 30 people and be overextended. And then half of those people don't get offers because that's a much worse situation to be All in around. than like you found something else to do your 2L summer and like moved on with your life. Like it's just not a great situation for anyone. Like the firms look bad. It's, you know, basically disastrous for the students. Um, and it's not really necessarily their fault that the firm just overhired. And some something to think about also is like if you don't get your you know, 2L job that you really wanted, a lot of times in this situation, firms will be, you know, extra conservative, and then 3L hiring will pick up. Um, You know, that's a trend I've noticed. So it's something you should keep your eyes out for. And you're not necessarily going to have to, you know, do the 2L job that you maybe was your fallback job that you took, maybe there is an opportunity to be a 3L. So kind of you have to be on top of it. Right. I think that's a good point. Like if the economy does turn around, right now I feel like we're just in a period of a lot of uncertainty, like a lot, even more so than like the average. Usually I feel like it's pretty clear, like, oh, something happened. Okay. There's going to be a recession. Like it's probably going to be this long. Now everyone's sort of like, well, I don't know, like things are looking good one week and then the (laughs) next week it's like not so much, you know? (laughs) So the stock market is all over the place. (laughs) Yeah. And like, you know, there's just a lot of stuff, you know, there are a lot of like external factors that play into all this and nobody, it's just a lot of unpredictability, I think. So Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think one of the things firms learned from 2008 is that they've really been hiring more conservatively even when times have been pretty good. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I don't think the summer classes ever got back to quite as big as they were before. They were huge. Like when I was a summer, it was like 100 plus people. And I don't think any of those firms like got that big again. Well, and they didn't care if they had 50 extra people. Right. You know, it was like, well, if they're great, we'll take them. I think it's totally different now. It's like we are going to give out the exact number of offers that we can take. And then if those people don't accept for the summer, you know, we'll hire later, but we're not going to make more offers than we can handle. Yeah, I know. It just felt like they were just throwing like money mm-hmm. around in like 2006 era. <laughs> yeah, different times for sure. Yeah. So I think that's all good that that people are hiring smarter and, you know, able to make offers to everybody that they hire. Yeah. What else do you think has changed since 2008? Uh, I think that firms are less leveraged. I think there's less of a chance of firms actually just going under suddenly, which all the firms that went under suddenly in 2008 were over leveraged. Um, And so I think they just got smarter. I think that, you know, people are more flexible. I think that, you know, more conservative all around. Um, and I think the summer classes, aside from them being smaller, they're just not as like extravagant as they were. Yeah. Uh, it was like ridiculous. We, let's I'm be honest. sure we all have stories about <laughs> crazy events. Just ridiculous. And, yeah. Very few people ever got no offered. Um, people could do anything basically. Um, you know, the lunch budgets were completely insane. Like you, it's hard to even spend that much money for lunch. 
Um, oh, we definitely spent that and more in New York City. No problem <laughs> daily. Like literally like four days a week you could get lunch for like, oh, we have a $50 budget per person that we just blew. Who's like throwing in extra money? Oh, wait. I just can't eat that much at lunch. <laughs> it was like you guys It was New York. Three. It was expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but it would be like, you know, three courses. Oh, yeah, and- of course. You'd have your appetizer, your dessert, your main course. And like, oh, yeah, in Boston would be like, we'd have a lobster for the main course. <laughs> So now it's like, we'll go to a food truck. Right, exactly. You can have a lobster sandwich from a food truck. Equally, exactly. probably actually more fun, to be honest. Exactly. And still more than you would probably spend on lunch if, yeah, if exactly. you just went out with your friend. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think it's just like the whole mood change. Um, and I don't think it's as bad as like 2009, 2010 was kind of a sad time. Right. Um, and, you know, some classes just, some firms just didn't do a summer class at all for multiple years you know they were like we need to catch up um that kind of thing but so i think it's gone you know it's kind of vacillated and it never went back to where it was but to me everyone's sort of being smarter about it yeah and i think even with like the hybrid work like people are probably reducing some office expenses and things like that so yeah i think the whole industry has just become a little bit more like financially responsible basically and just aware because people are aware of like what can happen um you know if you overextend yourself and you hire too many people like when your assets walk out the door every night that can go bad really quickly well and i think firms also realize like we should be putting more money into the client stuff and not (laughs) the internal things that no one's even going to hear about or see which true that's smarter well and i think they've gotten they're using technology somewhat more efficiently as well Um, so I think overall, a lot of these firms are just being run a little bit more like actual businesses than they were back in kind of like the boom days of like anything goes. And I actually, I still think that's better for a lot of the lawyers, like that they outsource some of the, you know, more boring work that, you know, a client doesn't need to be spending associate, you know, first year associate rates on. So you're getting better work. There's more work to be had, you know, if they're doing smaller classes. Um, The other thing is, you know, big law has a reputation of you're working and definitely all of that. I promise that no one's working like they were in 2004, like (laughs) since then. So even the stories you hear about how much people are working, it's not as crazy as it was. Oh, even Um, as a summer, I worked every day for the first two weeks, including to like three or four in the morning on the weekend. It's, it's definitely not like that. Yeah, like it was crazy. I was just like, what is happening right now? Like I missed my own birthday party. What? As a summer associate. As a summer. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely not <laughs> happening. <laughs> so yeah, I think they've just gotten smarter about where they're, you know, putting their resources and how people are being utilized. And I think that's better, you know, for the associates too. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, it does mean smaller classes, but it means if you get one of those positions, it's likely to be like a better quality of work, basically. Exactly, which I I think should be an important part of why you're doing this. Right, exactly. All right, well, before we wrap up, kind of give us your bottom line here. Like, how can somebody put themselves in the best position just knowing that things are probably tightening? I think just be proactive, be your own advocate, you're in charge of your career, you know, don't assume that things are going to work out or be entitled about it, even if you're at, you know, a really good school and you're doing well, I think you still should be working very hard, you know, to find a job. And you should be flexible to what is available, even if it's not your ideal. Um, So I think that's the way to go into it. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I think, you know, as we found out, even people from like very top schools basically got screwed over when things went really (laughs) south. So like we know that can happen. Everyone at a firm should know that could happen. Um, So yeah, you've got to be kind of the person who rises to the top in that scenario. I mean, I remember in the financial crisis, I was working at a firm and some partner was like, oh, this is great. Like now we can upgrade our attorneys because all these people are being laid off. (laughs) I heard that too. (laughs) I feel like that is really the way they were thinking. And so, you know, if your firm was doing well, for whatever reason, like you just, you know, you were kind of lucky on practice areas, or you've been smart or whatever, like it was actually a great time to go poach the best people. So you want to be, you know, as high in that category as you can be to set yourself up, like regardless of what the economy ends up looking like. Because as a reminder, uh, Harvard and Yale used to do OCI at the end of September, October, 
was always very far out from every other school because they felt like they could do that. Right. And the economy crashed in like August, September of 2008. And those students didn't get jobs. <laughs> like no <laughs> one was hiring Harvard and Yale. Like yeah, they just it can happen. couldn't it, do it. it so can that's anyone. a reminder that crazy things can happen. Yeah, and I think there's like a certain amnesia about this because yeah. it's always a, a new crop of people. But the reality is like things can happen. And in the end, like your pedigree is not necessarily going to save you if, if things really go exactly. south. Exactly. Because students might not even know some of this stuff. It's like 15 years ago. Yeah, it was like forever ago. It was like a lifetime ago. But like, yeah. and it's not the first time and only time that's happened either. So No, you know? that was just particularly <laughs> dramatic. Yeah. So just be aware and like, I think the, yeah, not being entitled, I think is really yeah. key because things do happen and you want to make sure that you're in a good position kind of personally, regardless of how this pans out. Exactly. I agree. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. With that, we are out of time. For more career help and the opportunity to work one-on-one with us, including on your OCI, you can check out careerdicta.com. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. You can also check out our Bar Exam Toolbox podcast if you have concerns about that. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.